Hey everyone, it's Sunday and it's time for another story time. Uh, I have with me one of my favorite types of lizards ever. I have a monitor lizard with me. Uh, this one in particular is an Argus monitor and his name is Arthur. If you've been to the reptile room, you have probably seen him. He's down near the back where we have all of our amphibians and our invertebrates because he has a nice large enclosure back there. Now, monitor lizards are exceptionally smart. Uh, most of them we could put at like bird level intelligence or small human level intelligence, like that of a six or a seven year old. Argus monitors in particular are known for being pretty crafty. Um, if you give these guys time, they can figure out how to get out of their cages. So you gotta be make sure you, that you have like a really good enclosure. You can lock them in that they can't figure out how to open up the doors. Uh, but these guys are great with puzzle feeders. So if you use any type of dog or cat enrichment, where they have to figure out how to slide doors or move stuff around to get food, monitors are really good at figuring out those types of puzzle feeders. Um, in fact, I've actually had better luck with monitors figuring those out than I usually do cats or dogs. Uh, they're very, very smart. They're very inquisitive. Uh, they can also be very personable. Once you get to spend time with the monitor and they get to know you and they realize that you're not a threat, they typically become pretty laid back. Now, he's still a little bit in his training phase, like still getting used to us. But you can see there are certain things I can do to him that get him calmed down. So he tends to like his ears rubbed. Um, he also tends to like the top of his head rubbed a little bit. And when I do that, I can actually feel his body loosen up a little bit on my hand. Now, he is still going to take any chance he can get to run away once I put him down. Because again, he's still in his training mode. He's still getting used to people. But for the most part, this guy does pretty good. Now, monitors are typically native to Australia, Asia, or Africa. Uh, these guys are a northern Australian species, which we sometimes just kind of consider part of the Asian subcontinent. And there's a big difference between all those monitors when you look at them. Typically, the Australian and Asian monitors are going to be very sleek looking. So he's got a very thin body, very, very narrow face, very like long neck. Whereas the African species tend to be bigger bodied, have really thick jowls, really thick necks, and they're, they're pretty stout. Uh, this guy lives in all kinds of different biomes. We'll find him in scrubland, grassland, near, usually near a body of water, but they can also inhabit where people are typically living. Uh, because of that, they've been able to acclimate themselves around people and realize that there's going to be food sources around us. So they'll, like, they'll actually use people in a, in a way to go and find their food. Mainly, they're going to be terrestrial, but they have very sharp claws and they're very dexterous, so they're actually pretty good at climbing. This long tail actually works really well as a rudder in the water so they can swim exceptionally well. And then they also like to dig burrows. So you actually, you'll find these guys in trees, underneath logs and rocks, running on the ground, or even near water and swimming in water. They'll hunt anything that they can catch. So they'll eat birds, they'll eat small mammals, lizards, snakes, uh, eggs, fish, and insects. They have a pretty wide variety in their diet, which means when you have them in captivity, you also need to be feeding them a really wide variety. An unfortunate thing a lot of times when people have monitors in captivity is that they tend to just feed them mice all the time and it makes them fat and happy, but you're actually kind of being detrimental to that animal's health. So you should be offering a pretty wide variety of things that they can go ahead and they can chomp on and chase and everything else like that. So um, this week's book uh, is called The Christmas Crocodile by Bonnie Becker. Uh, since it's the month of December or about to go into December, we're gonna do all Christmas themed books. We obviously don't have crocodiles here at the store, but I figured since there's crocodiles in Australia and we have a really cool monitor lizard who in a way kind of has a head like a crocodile, like a big long narrow sn uh, snout, we'll go ahead and read a crocodile book. So we'll get started on the Christmas crocodile, uh, reading to our friend Arthur here, the Argus monitor. What do you think, buddy? Oh, you're sizing things up, aren't you? Okay. The Christmas crocodile didn't mean to be bad, not really. Alice Jane found him on Christmas Eve under the tree. He wore a red bow around his neck. It was lovely, except he ate it. Then he ate a couple of presents, just little ones. And he gnawed on father's shoes, ate the wreath in the hall, and ran away with the Christmas roast, a big one. He was eating up Christmas and no one knew what to do with him. Send the beast to Africa, huffed Uncle Theodore, who had once hunted wild game there. He must be put in an orphanage, fretted Aunt Figgy, who worried a lot, especially about orphans.
Lock him in the back room, Alice Jane, instructed father, while we consider the situation. Better give him the pumpkin pie, said mother. He still looks hungry. Alice Jane crossed her arms and tapped her toe while the Christmas crocodile slunk into the back room. She closed and locked the door with a firm click. But then she thought she heard him sniffling in there. Not feeling hungry after all, she slipped him the pineapple upside down cake along with the pie. We could make him into a pair of shoes, said Uncle Theodore, who was busy considering things back in the parlor. Or a pet for some orphans, said Aunt Figgy. I wonder whose presents he ate, said Cousin Elwood, who had finally finished eating all the fudge the crocodile had missed and could now speak. He's nice, said Alice Jane. Maybe we should keep him. Unheard of, protested Aunt Figgy. But it's Christmas, said Alice Jane. Irrelevant, hampered Uncle Theodore. He's just a little hungry, that's all, said Alice Jane. Perhaps the zoo would take him, said Father worriedly. He needs a real home, cried Alice Jane. Well, think about it, dear, said Mother, and she sent them all to bed. The Christmas crocodile didn't mean to be bad, not really. But in the middle of the night, he ate through the back room door, swallowed 29 crumpets on the kitchen counter, a box of pralines, one fruitcake, five golden oranges, the left, stop, <laughs> the left stove top burner, and a plate of ginger star cookies that were for Santa. Then he crept upstairs. One door was open just a bit. He knelt it open a bit more. Inside, he found tasty talcum powder, a feather boa that tickled his tongue, and a swig of perfume. Just right. Then he found 10 pink toes. He sniffed them. Hmm. He licked them. Yum. He took a teeny tiny bite. Ah! Aunt Figgy screamed, shivered cobwebs in the attic, and made the dust dance on the bottle of a wine in the cellar. I'll save you, roared Uncle Theodore, waking with a start from a dream about cannibals. Run for your lives, shrieked Cousin Elwood. There's blood, gasped Aunt Figgy, pointing to a pinprick of red on her little toe. Where is he, sighed Mother. The Christmas crocodile didn't mean to be bad, not really. They found him hiding under Al Shane's bed. He tried to wag his tail in a friendly fashion, but it was too cramped. Into the cellar with him, commanded Father. The Christmas crocodile scooted sadly down the stairs to the basement. He shivered in the cold, but Alice Jane crossed her arms and tapped her toe. She closed and locked the door with a firm click. She went back to bed and lay under her warm blanket. She swallowed a lump in her throat. Somehow, it didn't feel like the night before Christmas anymore. She slipped out of bed, her blanket held close, and crept quietly down the stairs to the basement. She wrapped the crocodile snugly, tucking her blanket under his chin. She found an old candy cane covered with lint in her bathroom pocket, bathrobe pocket. She broke it in two. One for me and one for you, she whispered. The Christmas crocodile gulped happily and closed his eyes. The cellar door cracked open. You know, he could be an orphan, hissed Aunt Figgy, slipping inside. She tucked her hot water bottle under the crocodile's toes. A crocodile saved my life once, announced Uncle Theodore, coming in behind Aunt Figgy. Decent chap, really. He spread his Zulu robe over the crocodile's tail. Perhaps he's learned his lesson, said Father, peering around the doors and holding up his red earmuffs. Is it time to open the presents yet, Con yawned Cousin Elwood, stumbling in? He patted the crocodile on the snout and fell asleep. Mother came last. She spread a fluffy comforter across them all. We couldn't leave him alone, she said, not on Christmas Eve. Everyone nodded. The Christmas crocodile let out a contented snore. Full at last, observed Father. Everyone sighed. Then they all settled down to wait and watch. The Christmas crocodile didn't mean to be bad. Not really. But somehow everyone fell asleep. Somehow the crocodile slipped away. Somehow he ate through the basement door. They found him the next morning in the parlor, looking alarmingly round. Al Shane's blanket was gone. Aunt Faye's hot water bottle was gone. Uncle Theodore's Zulu robe was gone. 
Father's earmuffs were gone. Mother's comforter was gone. The Christmas tree was gone. A blue spruce. All the presents were gone except one. Pumpus' stomach yelled, Owl Elwood, send for my elephant gun, roared Uncle Theodore. Those were for the orphans, shrieked Aunt Figgy about the missing presents. What's that? asked Al Shane, pointing to one small present remaining. If you didn't want it, it must be bad, Cousin Elwood announced. Quite so, agreed Uncle Theodore. Aunt Figgy nodded. I'll open it, said Al Shane, and she quickly tore off the ribbon. December 25th, dear family, hope you like crocodiles. Love, Uncle Carbuncle. It's from Uncle Carbuncle, cried Cousin Elwood. Good old Carbuncle, shouted Uncle Theodore. Carbuncle at last, breathed Aunt Figgy. But we haven't got an Uncle Carbuncle, protested Al Shane. Since she was right, no one knew what to say. But Al Shane knew. It meant that the Christmas crocodile had been delivered to the wrong address. And sure enough, the doorbell rang. At the door were two delivery men. Take him away, Father said firmly. The two men hoisted up the crocodile and staggered down the snowy steps to a waiting van. Goodbye, said Al Shane sadly. The Christmas crocodile snuffled. One great crocodile tear ran down the snow, but then he saw the sign on the delivery van. I'll come visit soon, promised Al Shane as they loaded him in the van. Merry Christmas, cried the delivery men. Merry Christmas, cried one and all. The Christmas crocodile didn't mean to be bad, not really. He waved his tail farewell, but as a van round the corner, it did look rather like a delivery man's cap in his jaws. Well, sighed mother, peace at last. Yes, agreed everyone, except Alice Jane, who didn't say a word. The end. So, that's a really fun story about getting an accidental gift for Christmas. Uh, although I don't think a crocodile would probably be the greatest gift for anybody. No one should really be owning crocodiles or alligators unless you have like a ton of room and giant pools and steady access to food and everything for them. Till then, we'll stick to a little bit smaller guys here like Arthur. And even Arthur's not gonna stay super small. Arthur's gonna get five feet long with his tail. So even he needs a lot of room to run around and the right kind of home. So. Hope you guys learned a little bit about Argus monitors, and I hope you enjoyed our book, The Christmas Crocodile. We'll see you next time.